From what I understand, most people, even true mayonnaise fans, can struggle with the mayo texture as the volume of mayo increases. Like a smear on a sandwich is great, but a pickup truck full of mayonnaise is gross. Am I getting that right? Yeah, that's not true for me. Because my motto is time is money, money is power, power is mayonnaise, and mayonnaise is knowledge. Okay, before we dig into how to make and use and appreciate the beautiful sauce and or condiment that is mayonnaise, we need to do a little bit of discombobulation of the words mayonnaise and aioli. Somewhere along the line, folks decided that the name mayonnaise wasn't cool enough to be put on menus. So instead of mayonnaise, they would write aioli. Aioli is a beautiful word, I'll give you that. But it's a beautiful word that has an actual meaning. And that meaning isn't exactly mayonnaise. The purest original version of aioli is an emulsion of garlic and olive oil with some salt for seasoning. It's made by slowly emulsifying oil into a garlic puree in a mortar and pestle. It's intense and wonderful, and I think it deserves to keep its name. I often hear people say that they don't like mayonnaise, but they like aioli. And I think what they really mean is, hi, I'm Fred, and I like flavored mayonnaise. Well, Fred, me too. And we're gonna make some seriously amazing flavored mayos, but first, I wanna talk about brands. Because when it comes to mayonnaise, people have brand preferences. Is Hellman's the best? Duke's? Kewpie? Cane's? What about Miracle Whip? I grew up in a Hellman's household. That would be best foods if you grew up west of the Rockies. And it just tastes right to me. I thought I'd never want another mayo in my fridge. But then I tried Duke's and I love it too. A little less tang, a little more plush. And Kewpie? Well, of course I have to have Kewpie on hand. That MSG umami punch and weirdly squishy bottle, love it. I'm really curious where your allegiances lie. So in the comments, let me know what you love and maybe even where you grew up. And let's try and keep it civil down there. And while you're down there in the nether regions of this video, hit like, subscribe, and that little bell so you never miss one of my episodes. Store-bought mayonnaise is amazing. Don't let anyone ever shame you for using it. But homemade is also incredibly special. It's customizable and it's easy. It all starts with a little sweet emulsion science. If you take only one thing away from this video, I hope it is this. Emulsions are amazing because emulsions equal creamy. Milk, whether it's cow or plant-based, is an emulsion. Cream is an emulsion. Butter is an emulsion. Ice cream is an emulsion. And mayonnaise is an emulsion. We take liquid oil, which is thin, slick, greasy, and turn it semi-solid and creamy. It may as well be magic, but of course, it's not. If you were to zoom in on a dense emulsion such as mayonnaise, you would see tons of tiny oil droplets tightly packed together, but not actually touching. Keeping those droplets separate is the key to a stable emulsion. But it's a fragile business because the droplets are attracted to one another. And if they merge, the emulsion fails. And that's why emulsions contain emulsifiers. In mayonnaise, these are the lecithin in egg yolks and the polysaccharides found in mustard, which form thin barriers around each oil droplet so that they can coexist without coalescing into greasy pools. As you crowd more oil droplets into the small amount of water found in the mayonnaise, it becomes thicker because it makes it increasingly harder for the liquids surrounding the droplets to flow. Here's an analogy I learned from Cook's Illustrated senior science research editor, Paul Adams, and it really paints a clear picture for me. Think of the water in a mayonnaise as a group of bikers, like in the Tour de France. As a group, they move and flow rapidly. Now think of the oil droplets as elephants. Yeah, elephants. If we add just a few elephants amongst the group of bikers, the bikers are going to slow down as these big, beautiful animals get in their way. But they can keep moving. That is a vinaigrette. But let's say we added a lot more elephants. At some point, they disrupt the flow of bikers so much that they can no longer keep moving. That elephant-loaded bike race is mayonnaise. The key to making a stable emulsion is to break the oil into tiny droplets and have emulsifiers in place that will surround those droplets. Lecithin molecules have a phosphate head end that's soluble in water, linked to two fatty acid tails that are soluble in fat. In mayo, the water-loving heads line up on the exterior of oil droplets, while their little tails just into the oil. They are ready and waiting to do their job. You just need to serve them up tiny oil droplets. Let's go to the kitchen and learn how to do just that. I first learned how to make mayonnaise using a whisk. Now, if I'm somewhere without access to any heavy machinery, I'll still do that. The challenges of making mayo by hand are twofold. You must pour the oil in slowly with one hand while whisking vigorously with the other so that enough of the oil gets broken into properly small droplets. Mess up either one of those and you have a break on your hands. So it's doable, but challenging. Start with just yolk and mustard and add oil very slowly. When it starts to thicken, add a little lemon juice. 
Now go back to oil and continue whisking until it is thick again. Now whisk in a little water to thin it, and then switch back to oil. One yolk contains enough lecithin to emulsify 100 cups of oil. That's eight gallons of mayonnaise. So you can keep going back and forth with oil and water until you have as much mayo as you need. Bringing in power equipment can make things a lot easier and generally more fail-proof. My favorite way is using an immersion blender. I'll combine our egg yolk, mustard, and lemon juice in a tall jar like this. Now I stick in the immersion blender and pour my oil down the side of the blender so that it settles on top. Then I just turn on the immersion blender and watch as mayonnaise starts to form at the very bottom. Once it gets going, I start to slowly bring the immersion blender up to incorporate more oil until I get all the way to the top. This is homemade mayonnaise in about two minutes. Now the reason this method works is that the immersion blender pulls in oil relatively slowly through the openings on the head of the blender directly into a very fast blade. The key here is to use a container that is only slightly wider than the head of the immersion blender. That gives you a nice thick layer of liquid and emulsifiers for the oil to sit on top of. If you use a wider vessel, everything is spread out too much. This method allows you to make a small amount of mayonnaise very quickly. The food processor method, up next, requires a certain volume for it to work. This food processor mayonnaise recipe comes to us from Cook's Illustrated senior editor, Lon Lamb, and it has a completely novel method, plus a way to avoid eating raw eggs. Just in case, raw eggs is one of the reasons you may have avoided making homemade mayonnaise in the past. We stir together three tablespoons of water, two egg yolks, and a little lemon juice in a bowl until no streaks of yolk remain. Then we simply microwave it until it hits 160 to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. We'll stir every 10 seconds. It only takes about a minute or two, and the yolks are then fully safe to eat. Then we add a quarter cup of oil, salt, mustard, and sugar. After whisking that to combine, we'll strain this mixture through a fine mesh strainer directly into the bowl of our food processor. Now with the machine running, we slowly drizzle in the remaining one and a quarter cups of oil in a nice thin stream over the course of about two minutes. And that is it. Because of our pasteurization, this can be refrigerated for up to one month. The crazy thing about all of this emulsion stuff is that once you make a stable mayo, it's a permanent emulsion. That's not true for something like a vinaigrette, which will break over time. It's so stable, in fact, that you can add quite a lot of liquid and other ingredients to it without it breaking. And here is where we get into our aioli, I mean, flavored mayonnaises. I have nothing against garlic mayo, sriracha mayo, or even gochujang mayo but I find it pretty hard to beat what the Peruvians do with mayonnaise. I'm talking about the aji amarillo and the aji verde sauces that accompany pollo a la brasa, which are impossibly delicious rotisserie chickens. Each are dead simple to make with a blender. For our aji amarillo sauce, we have mayo, aji amarillo paste, lime juice, garlic, and huacatay paste. Aji amarillo is a yellow Peruvian chili that is fruity and spicy. It's easiest to find it in a jar around here. Huacatay, often referred to as black mint, isn't actually mint at all. It has a medicinal earthy flavor that gives backbone to the sauce. And for our aji verde, we blend mayonnaise, stem seeded jalapeno, cilantro, cotija cheese, lime juice, huacate, and garlic. They are beautiful to look at and incredibly flavorful. Mm. The yellow sauce is bright with fruity flavor of aji amarillo, and the aji verde is a celebration of green chili. It's grassy and earthy. Now these are of course perfect for chicken, but don't stop there. Fried yuca, french fries, roasted vegetables as a spread on sandwiches, can't stop, won't stop. Now besides just adding things to mayonnaise and eating it, mayo's creaminess and viscosity make it incredibly versatile. My buddy J. Kenji Lopez-Alt wrote for the New York Times how mayonnaise is an excellent marinade because its viscosity means it sticks to the protein, whereas oil pretty much just runs off. Now that's a fun use for mayonnaise. Many people like to use mayo on their bread when making grilled cheese, but I'm not one of them. Yes, it's easy to spread. Yes, it helps bread brown because it is mostly oil. No, it does not taste like butter that browns while the sandwich cooks. But I sure do love mayo inside of a sandwich. Here's a use you've probably never heard of, chocolate cake. Yep, that's right. We have a simple chocolate cake recipe, which is linked below, that calls for two thirds of a cup of mayonnaise in place of oil. Though it might sound strange, it was a common technique back in the day. And just take a look at the impact of this unusual ingredient. Check out this experiment. This cake contains two thirds of a cup of mayo, and this one contains the components of the mayonnaise, but unemulsified. The mayo cake rises higher and has a fine, even crumb. Once again, that's thanks to added viscosity and a thicker batter that can trap more air and rise. But at the end of the day, I come back down to earth and the single finest way to eat mayonnaise, a BLT. I take white bread that I've griddled in butter on just one side. 
Then I slather mayo on the untoasted sides. Next, I layer on the crispy, thin-cut bacon, iceberg lettuce, thick tomato slices, and plenty of salt and pepper. Mmm, mmm, mmm. This is the finest sandwich on earth and is definitely how to eat mayonnaise. Thank you all so much for watching. Now, I'm assigning you a little bit of homework here. In the comments, I really wanna know what's your brand preference for store-bought mayonnaise and maybe throw in where you grew up. I'd love to see if there's a correlation. Now down there, you can also find a link to cooksillustrated.com slash what's eating Dan. There you can find the recipes from this show and seriously every single episode that we've done over six seasons. So you definitely need to check that out. Looking forward to seeing you next time. And in the meantime, go eat mayonnaise.